Hi everyone and welcome to another bonus episode of the Mental Health Family Hour. So it's been a couple of weeks since we've done an episode and we are joined by some wonderful guests today. So today we are going to be talking about domestic abuse and just to touch on some housekeeping before we carry on with the rest of the episode. Please, if you are going to ask any questions, refrain from swearing on the Twitch stream. Uh, Dave and one of his colleagues is going to monitor that as we go along. We will pick the questions up at the end of the webinar if anyone has any questions um, following the session, please do email me on sam.tyre, so T-Y-R-E-R, at lscft.co.uk. So, quick introduction to who myself and Dave are, if this is the first time watching. My name's Sam Tyra, I'm the Prevention and Engagement Lead at Lancashire and South Cumbria Foundation Trust. I'm also the founder of uh, a service called Change Talks, which aims to prevent mental health issues. And I'm also the co-host of this show. Dave. <laughs> um, my name is Dave, aka Mindset by Dave. I am a mindset and mental health coach. And if you are coming through Twitch, this is my platform on Twitch, I guess, where I basically run mental health drop-in chats um, every Tuesday and every Sunday. Tuesday in the daytime from 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. and Sunday in the evening from 7 p.m. till 10 p.m., as well as providing mental health advice, help and connection online through pretty much every social media outlet ever, um, always under the name of Mindset by Dave. I think that's the quickest introduction we've ever done for ourselves. Well, that's actually. because we've got we've got more important people to talk today. So, wonderful guests. <laughs> so, Rebecca Wilson, please could you introduce yourself and just tell us a bit about yourself? Hi. Yes, I'm Rebecca Wilson. I am the communications officer for the Wish Centre Domestic Abuse Charity in Blackburn with Darwin. I also look after our lovely volunteers. Um, we are the commission service for Blackburn with Darwin um, for domestic abuse. We run two refuges in the area. Um, we also deal with honour-based violence, forced marriage and FGM as part of our domestic abuse remit. And we, we will put a link to the Wish Centre on the YouTube description as well, so everyone can find out a bit more there. Thank you for that. Rebecca Hyam, coming to you. Hi, hi I'm Rebecca Hyam. I'm a specialist safeguarding practitioner at Lancashire and South Cumbria Foundation Trust. That's a long title. Um, I work as part of the safeguarding team and we come across domestic abuse daily, more than once a day, um, in different remits. So I contacted yourself, Sam, and asked if we could cover a topic uh, with this. seemed a great platform to do it. And then contacted Rebecca Wilson um, as an expert on the subject. Um, I've also heard Sammy speak and thought she would be absolutely wonderful for this. So that's why we're here. Which, which fits nicely into you, Sammy, introducing <laughs> you to all. Hiya. <laughs> Hiya, I'm Samantha. Um, I'm an ex-service user at the Wish Centre. Um, I'm here today really to talk a little bit about my story. Thanks, Sam. So, so, so the first thing that I just want to touch on before going to, to Sammy's story Whichever Rebecca can answer this, what for, for the, the people watching, what actually is domestic abuse? That'll be um, <laughs> Yeah, me. Okay. So um domestic abuse is um abuse from a family member to another family member or intimate partner. So it can be parent, child, brother, sister, um, or intimate partners. Um it comes in the form of physical abuse, psychological or emotional abuse, it can be financial abuse, it can be sexual abuse. And we often, when we see one type of abuse, there will be others. It's very rare that there is only ever one type of, of abuse. Um, and it is classless, you know, it can affect anybody, every walk of life. And uh, I think as well, it could, it so the Wish Centre, does that work with, with males and females? We do. We work with males and females. We, we're very proud of our whole family ap approach, really. We've got a specialist children's team, so we work with children and young people. We also have a perpetrator team um, because we're very much of the opinion if you're, you can't just deal with one side of the coin, um, because what very often what we see is if a perpetrator has been perpetrated to one person, they will simply move on and become perpetrated to another. So we do aim to tackle both sides of that coin. And, and could you tell us, because I, I, I've seen quite a, a lot of uh, things in the news regarding domestic abuse, especially since COVID. 
people being trapped uh, at home with with their abusers. What was it like when we sort of went into lockdown in regards to people reaching out for your service? Um, it was quite scarily quiet initially, uh, which was which was quite frightening for us because we knew that there were people out there and we knew what would be happening in in those homes that experienced domestic abuse. Um, so we were just really keen to get that message out that that you didn't have to stay there. If you were seeking support or you were seeking refuge, you could leave your home. Sadly, um, that message, I mean, the message did go out and we did see an increase in people coming to us. We were in the very fortunate position that we could, we got two of our flats ready at refuge so as people could isolate because that, that was a, a big issue. Um, people having to self-isolate for 14 days when they came in. Not many refuges were in that position. And sadly, we saw um, refuge beds drop by a third across the country, um, which was horrific. Um, the thought that actually the numbers were going up, but the beds were coming down was, was terrifying. Um, and sadly, domestic homicides doubled um, in the first few weeks of lockdown. Um, which, although predictable, was desperately sad, obviously. And do, do, do children ever reach out to you as well? or They do. Sort of young people, teenagers, um, if, they, if they have the opportunity to get in touch with us, they often do. Um, the live chat service has really helped. And during COVID, we've put some special resources on our website for children and young people. So um, they've been on there. They've been looking at those and they've reached out over the live chat, which has been great. Perfect. And, and Rebecca, have, have you seen a, a, a big difference since since the beginning of lockdown in March in regards yeah. to your work? Yeah, we probably saw the same as Rebecca. I think it, it was really frightening. You feel like victims wouldn't have somewhere to go um, before it was, you know, we, we open up as many opportunities as we can, GP appointments, hospital appointments, health visitors, midwives. People weren't going into homes, people weren't going to appointments, routine appointments were stopped. So I think for us, it was just not having that opportunity to ask those questions. Um, we're doing a really big push at the moment. Um, I don't know if Sammy ever had anybody when she was, you know, sort of when you had your children, midwives, health visitors, but we're doing a really big push for all health practitioners to be asking the questions when, when we are coming in contact with men, women, asking the question, you know, is domestic abuse a factor in your life? Are you frightened of your partner? You know, are you a victim of domestic abuse? Are you controlled? So I think with us not having those appointments, not having health visitors, not going in houses, midwives not going in houses, we just didn't have that opportunity. And it's it's those opportunities that hopefully will make people speak out. And we just, we're missing those. It's exactly what Rebecca said, just yeah, scary. Could I ask something, <laughs> Sam? Sorry. Um, yeah, one, cool. one thing I'd really love to kind of highlight is obviously whilst COVID's been going on and people have been at home with their abuser 100% of the time, well, it is what are ways in which a person can actually reach out when they obviously can't speak out in that moment? Like if they can't, if they're afraid to actually be, you know, vocal on a phone in case the person overhears, are there any kind of ways in which you would say to a person, this is a way that you can connect with someone discreetly absolutely um if if someone is already working with this it's highly likely they will have the mobile phone number of their key worker so a text message could you know to reach out we also we've we started the live chat service during lockdown so that's available daily from um 10 a.m till noon and then from 2 p.m until 4 p.m every day if you are in danger and you can't speak, dial 999 and press 55. And that will let the call operator know that you can't speak, but you need police support. Okay. Can I, can I also signpost as well? There is an organisation called Shout. And if one is in a, a situation where they, they don't feel safe or they're concerned about something, you can also text out and basically if you are in danger, you know, just like you said regarding uh, ringing 999, they can get you immediate help as well um, through texting into them if you if you can't go on the phone. Um, is there any, anything else that you'd like to add to today's question? No? Nope. Um, so, so 
if they're working with us, they will have a mobile phone number. Um, there is the live chat. They can email at info at the wish org or, you know, if they're in danger, the 99955, that's called Silent Solution. So if you if you search on the internet for Silent Solution, the instructions will be there. So when when people do attend to your service for the first time, how, how do they how do you get themselves? Are they really fearful of, of reaching out for support? They can be. Um, I mean, on average, someone is assaulted 35 times before they reach out for help. Um, so they are already in a place where th- they're frightened um, and they've been through so much before they get to us. And I think it's like anything. I mean, you know, Sammy, Sammy I'm sure, w- will agree, but it's that fear of judgment, I think. Um, yeah. Sadly, there is shame still attached to domestic abuse there absolutely shouldn't be um but it is that um embarrassment perhaps um and I think there is that fear of of reaching out um but again I hope Sammy will agree that everyone at the Wish Centre is really approachable completely non-judgmental they're amazing (laughs) (laughs) they're like my family now (laughs) Uh, now from from if for example, I was uh, aware that one of my friends was in a relationship where they was they was being abused, and that the end of it, my friend, for example, they wouldn't reach out for support. What what advice would you give to me to actually try to actually encourage them to to reach out or or support them? Is there anything that I could do to try and help? I think the biggest thing you can do is just be there and just listen. Whatever you do, and we we have seen this so many times, friends and family members become so frustrated with the person that's suffering abuse that they say, I can't I can't do it anymore. I can't listen to you anymore. I can't. That is the worst thing you can do because a perpetrator, one of their key targets is to isolate that person. And by you turning your back on that person, you are isolating them still further. A person will not leave or reach out until they feel they are able to. It's just about being patient and being there for that person no matter what, but do not turn your back on them. And do, and do you think that some people that are the victim, that, that some of them aren't actually aware that they are being abused? Does it, has it just become the norm to them? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because it doesn't start off with you know high risk abuse or high level abuse it starts off very very slowly and we at the wish centre call it love bombing you get that initial you're my entire world I want you with me all the time no don't wear that wear this you look much nicer in this no that that friend of yours I've heard her talking about you she's no good for you she's not really your friend so it starts off you wouldn't even necessarily notice the signs and then it escalates. And what we do see most of is the sort of emotional, psychological, controlling type behaviours because your self-esteem is worn down, your self-confidence gets to an all-time low and you think that this person has got your best interests at heart and that they're, you know, they're telling you all these things for your own good, for your own safety. Um, and before you know it, you're completely isolated. And they don't have to use violence very often because it only takes one episode of violence before then they can threaten to use violence. And you know they mean it, so you just toe the line anyway. Um and we do often get people that have, have been referred to our service, maybe by children's services, who arrive on that first appointment and say, I don't even know why I'm here. I'm not I'm not suffering abuse. He's just, you know, he's he's got a bad temper or this or she's this. Um, and it's only after working with us and, and uh, looking at the power and control wheel, I can I can maybe send you a power and control wheel for you to display some I don't know if you've got anywhere to display it and looking at those behaviors on there that they think gosh yes I've experienced that and that and that um so it's very much a journey um once they walk through our door it's the big first step of the journey and do, do you think that this type of stuff needs to be because obviously my, one of my focuses of my job is the education within schools 
do you think that this needs to be taught in schools and do you think it could potentially prevent a lot of young people falling into that trap if they were aware of what people were doing to them? Absolutely, I really do. Um, I mean, we, and, and I think Sammy has helped out as a volunteer in some of the schools um, that we used to go into, but sadly, funding cuts uh, mean that now we can't go into the secondary schools and colleges in the same way that we used to. Um, but we used to do assemblies and drop-in sessions and specific uh, presentations to health and social care classes um, and... Um, you know, it did it did spread the word and it did hopefully make some young people look at relationships and begin to understand what is healthy and what is not healthy. Um, and it, it absolutely I know that uh, that my children are well up on on what's healthy yeah, and what's not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we can try we can try and work on that though. I think that this will be another call, but I'd like to try and get that embedded into the, the work that myself and Dave are focusing on to try and embed that into schools. It'd be absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. Just before I ask you, Sammy, I've got one more question for Rebecca Hyden, please. Um, do you think that because obviously I'm a nurse by background and we was never taught about domestic abuse or anything within my nursing degree do you think as practitioners that should be taught within the university setting um yeah absolutely um i obviously did my nurse training before you um and it, it wasn't touched on at all i remember i was a health visitor when sort of routine inquiry was first sort of bandied about really um and when we say routine inquiry we mean for health practitioners we need to be asking everybody at most contacts every contacts if safe, if, you know, there is domestic abuse within their life. And I remember when it came out and we, we all sat in an office and was like, oh, my goodness, how do you go in somebody's house and ask them that? It's really uncomfortable. And goes back to what Rebecca was saying about, you know, shame or stigma. It was really uncomfortable. And until you've done that day in, day out and see people's responses, it, it remains uncomfortable. So now that it's it's becoming more and more, we want people to do it, you know, across Lancashire Care Children's Nurses. We want people to ask. And I think the more we ask, the more people who are suffering, I don't think people will say yes on the first time. Yes, absolutely. Please help me. That's not going to happen. But we're planting the seeds so that when somebody is ready to ask for help, they can think, oh, she asked me about that. I could go to her. Um, and I know previously I've had people phone when I was a health visitor, denied domestic abuse on all of my visits. And then one morning rang and said, I need help. So it does work. Um, I don't think it'll work every time, but we need to make sure that people know. And I think, again, in through lockdown, that would have been really helpful. If people who are victims could think, I actually need help now. And I know if I go to my GP, they're going to ask me. It could be, you know, you could build that into plans. Um, it's just another option that we need to get out there. But people need educating. I think that's, you know, the basis behind this. Let's get the message out there. And it's been so difficult throughout lockdown, in a sense, for, for practitioners, hasn't it? Because you know, I recently had a baby, and I think that the health yeah. visitor has only visited, I think we had a phone call, and then the visits have been really spread out. I think we've got one more that's happening today, actually, whilst I'm at work. But other than that, they've obviously reduced the amount of times that they're going in. But the, the times that they've called, I've been present, so they never asked them questions. So does it does it worry you that there's, yeah. there's so many missed opportunities to, to, to raise this to people? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think um, people will be sort of um, basing the visits on whether or not they have got concern. Uh, perhaps some people will get more visits than other people get. But until you've gone into that house and sort of seen what's going on within that house, you don't know whether you're concerned or not. So it's it's massive. And, you know, we've spoke about your health visitor experience and and your wife isn't going to build a relationship with her health visitor because it's a phone call, whereas Previously, that used to be something that that could happen. Hopefully, things will obviously improve as lockdown ends, if ever. But yeah, it's a scary time. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. So, Sammy, hi. Are, are you okay to to share sort of your experiences with us? Yes. Thank you very much. So, um, I went through domestic violence for about eight years. I had three children in that time. Um, I probably. I needed help quite a lot of the time, but I wouldn't have asked for it, even if you'd have asked me straight out. I think um, I've had a lot of missed opportunities where I could have had help. 
like like you say, like you being sat there on visits, it doesn't give the chance for the mid- midwife or health visitor to ask the lady themselves. Um, I think that a lot of abusers would actually sit there with the lady so you couldn't ask them that. So, yeah, um, I went to a lot of appointments. I would actually make myself orange in the face so you couldn't see bruises. That wasn't that didn't look out of the ordinary to some, but it should have done, I think. Should have highlighted a lot for me. But yeah, I think if you if you want to hide it, you will hide it. And that is the thing about it. When you're coming into the homes, if they don't want to show you things, they won't show you. You've got to look between the lines and look around what's happening, really. I can think. I, can I ask? So, if you don't mind me asking, by the way, I don't. I never like asking. No, it's people. fine. Ask um, away. <laughs> when when did the abuse start for you in your in the relationship? It was started it most- six months into my relationship before I was pregnant or anything? About six months in, yeah. It was was it all? Did it tend to be sort of the emotional side of things first before anything turned violent or? It was little bits of emotion, but I didn't see it for what it was. I do see it now. So I think it starts with little bits of, oh, you can't do this, or please don't do that, or you'd look better if you wore this. You just get little things in there so that you listen to them, or you think, oh, they're really caring, I'll I'll do as they ask me to do, before next comes violence, because you think, you know, no, I'm actually going to wear what I want to wear today. And then the violence comes. And as Rebecca said, once that violence is there, you know, you know your line and you know you need to stay below that line or you are going to be confronted with violence. And and when when sort of the, the emotional abuse started, did you realise? No. You, you know? Not at all. I think I was young. I was only 17. Um, I had actually experienced any domestic violence within my family, so I didn't... I was not aware at all. My my father was really nice to my mum, you know, he always tried to write. So really, you'd think that I'd see it for what it was straight away, but I didn't. I just thought he was being caring, overly loving and things like that. And did, 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 I'm trying to think of... I'm trying to think about the word things. So I, I do find it really. I don't like asking personal stuff, but I get it. I get I get asked stuff so personal. It's the other way around. I find it quite I find it quite challenging. So did did they basically? Did he try to isolate you away from your friends? I was very within the end of my relationship. The last eighteen months I spent without any family or friends because it just got that bad that you know you cover it up for them. You cover it up so your family don't understand it. What are you doing? Like, why are you staying in this situation? You need to leave. Your children need to leave. So you actually back away from your family because you've got your partner like, no, oh, we're together. We're a family. Like, they, they're not our family. We'll be fine on our own. So you actually back yourself away from people, helping them isolate you. Yeah. And did, did, he, did he tend to insult you and then follow that up with kindness, saying, oh, I love you? And then, yeah, you know, definitely. Like, when did hit you? You know, it's always I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I'll never do it again. I'll, I'll, I'll treat you right. And you always think, okay, it's not going to do it again. You actually want to believe them because you do love this person. Yeah. So you want to believe what they're saying. And what, what? How long was it into the relationship that it turned violent? Uh, at six, seven months in, yeah. Quite, quite early. Yeah, but I'd say it was about four years before I sat there and thought, I'm going through domestic violence. Yeah. Never, I never sat there and thought, I'm actually going through <coughs> something here. Yeah. I didn't think that at all. What was the um, What was the point I, that made you made you change? Your, well, change the way you viewed it. Um, I think I've I'd heard about like refugees and things like that. I used to actually say to him, one day I'll leave you and I'll go to a refuge and I would never come back. And in my head, when I was saying it, I knew that I wasn't actually going to go because I wasn't ready at that point. But I did know there was services out there to help me. It's just believing in yourself that you're going to leave and not go back. Mm. What was the turning point? Um, they were going to take my children. Yeah, there was that much violence that it was like, right, if you go back to him, we will take your children. And for me, 
that was that was the turning point. I wasn't going. I wasn't going to lose all my children. What were the fears for you when you um, first thought about reaching out to one of the refugees? Um, that he won't leave me alone. I knew every time I left him, he harassed me constantly. He would always say, "Who is he?" It was never about the violence. It was always, "Who am I leaving him for?" Because it cannot be the violence. Why would you leave him over that? It's who am I leaving for? Mm -hmm. So it's like you've got to prove to them and yourself that you're actually leaving because of the violence here, not because you're going to somebody else. And did, so, did yeah, you, it was. It took a long time for that change point for me. And did, did your children ever witness any of the violence? Yes, they did. Very, very, very bad. They were very affected by it. It took us a lot of years to recover, all of us, really. How, how long ago was this? I left eight years ago now, so <laughs> I've been on my own for eight years now with my children, so I think you've had a, it's an amazing, absolutely amazing turnaround. It, it really is. Thank you. <laughs> what What would you say to, to someone if they're watching that are in the position that you was, if they are, you know, being hit by the partner, if they're being emotionally abused, what, what advice would you give them? That you are worth more than that, and you don't deserve that. Nobody deserves that. If anybody is doing that to you, they don't love you like they say they love you. And and get the help that's out there because there's lots of people that will help you. Like the Wish Centre, they're amazing. They will help you understand. They will help you know that you're worth more than that. And that's what it comes down to is what you feel you're worth because they have grind you down that much that you feel you're not worth anything. And when, and when when you try when when you did leave, what was was the sort of a, a point where the contact just stopped immediately, or was he consistently trying to keep? No, I was harassed for about seven weeks until he was arrested. One hundred and fifty messages a day, going from "I love you" to "I'm going to kill you." There was no in between, up and down. They were like, they, what you need to do to make them leave you alone is use the police and services. That's what you need to do because they're there to help you. And they, they don't want to leave you alone. But I always say, you know, people are scared of going to the police and using these services. But I will say that's what will keep you safe when you leave, is that you utilise all the services that are there for you. Yeah. Can I just make a point about the stalking? After, after you've left the relationship and, and that unwanted contact, that is stalking. Yes. There is now legislation in place um, yes. to protect people from stalking and harassment. And terrifyingly, um, there's been a recent study done by the University of Gloucester. Um, they studied 358 murders of women, um, domestic homicides, and 94% of them included stalking prior to the murder. So if you are experiencing unwanted attention from a former partner, please reach out. Stalking yeah. is a very, very high risk activity. And does that, is that via texting calls, turn up at your house? Um, yeah. When you block the number, do, you know, are you finding that they find different ways to contact the, the individual? Of course. They'll use yeah. other people's phones, yeah. Fake profiles, I suppose. Yeah. Just report it all. You've just got to report everything to keep yeah. you safe. Yeah. We at The Wish do have a specialist. Uh, she's called an Isaac, independent stalking advice uh, caseworker. And um, she specialises in, in stalking. The opportunities now for stalking because of technology are vast. And um, there was, during lockdown... Um, there's an antiviral company, I can't remember the name, but computer antivirus company noticed an increase in spyware of 83%. Oh. 83%. And it purely was because they couldn't leave the house, so they had to find other ways of monitoring the person that, that they wanted to monitor, and there'd been an increase in 83%. Do you, think, do you think, do you think that things like social media apps contribute to this as well? Because I know, like Snapchat has, a, you can basically see the location of someone more or less to the, the pinpoint. Yeah, 
That is one of the when when someone first comes to the wish or first comes into our refuge, we do what's called a safety plan with them. Um, and one of the first items on that safety plan is turn off your location settings for everything. Do not have them on. You don't need them. Nobody needs to know where you are. Uh, turn them off. <laughs> Mine's still turned off now, eight years later. <laughs> Tommy, can I ask, why, yeah. why, why do you think you did it? Um, for me, I think some families are stuck in the rut of that. So his family previously, his parents all did the same kind of thing. He, he grew up in that. He grew up in it. And it's no excuse. It is no excuse. But you will form children that think that is normal by them growing up in that. And then we get adults that think it's fine to treat their girlfriends like this because that is all they have ever seen. So it is about getting in there and it's stopping that cycle. Like I've stopped that cycle now for my family. So it would never carry on. But it is all about stopping that cycle. And, and when, Rebecca, when you work with the abusers at Wish, do, do you ever ask them why? It, basically, it's about power and control. Um, and and that's, that's male on female violence and vice versa. It's about whoever is, is using abusive behaviours want to be in complete control. And that's whether they think they're entitled to be in control or potentially have insecurities that have led to that type of behaviour. But that's basically all it is. It is wanting power and control and thinking they are entitled to it. Yeah. Um, drugs and alcohol can be a contributing factor, but, you know, there are lots of people that get drunk and still aren't abusive. So it's not a reason um, I know people will say, well, it's only when, when they've had a drink. It's only when n n it, it might only happen I, then. Yeah, I feel that like alcohol fuels what's already there. It's yes. not going to fuel what's not already there. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, you know, there are a whole host of reasons. And when perpetrators first come to us and, and we go through that assessment process, because there is an assessment process to to work on on with the perpetrator team, Um there has to be an acknowledgement that their behaviour is not appropriate because unless you get that acknowledgement, you, you can't make the changes. If you believe that your behaviour is, is right, you're never going to change your behaviour. So there is quite a stringent assessment process to work with the perpetrator team and to go on the Make the Change course. Um, and, yeah, those questions are, are brought up and usually it is a case of, well... You know, I'd had a drink or I'd had a, but we aim to to change that viewpoint. So as you really have to look internally at yourself and your own motivations, um, and then the hope is that that change will follow. Do you find do, do people sign voluntarily for that course, or are is it? Yeah, or, it has to be voluntarily. You know, it has to be. Uh, voluntary really um, because you can't force change um, you know it has to be something so it can be court ordered you know family courts can often say we'd like you to do a domestic violence perpetrators program um, but they will still have to go through the assessment process whether it's court ordered or not. Sorry, I, I was just going to say um, do you find that a lot of people that are perpetrators have come from a background of being abused themselves. You know, obviously we hear the expression hurt people, hurt people quite a lot. Um, do you find that there is a lot of that? Yes, I would say that um, a lot of the people on our perpetrator programme have, in a way, got very similar um, difficulties as as the victims have you know there, there can be issues with mental health there can be issues with um financial issues you know benefit difficulties housing problems a background of drugs and alcohol um a difficult childhoods um and it's it's the way that, that those 
issues manifest themselves as to whether it becomes perpetrator behavior or, or sort of victim behaviors if you will yeah. um but yeah but yeah very much there's there's usually something in the background and is there is there actually a large number of people that like of perpetrators that do want to become better like you know you said it before sometimes it's court orders other times it's voluntary is that actually something you see that people want to be better have acknowledged it and yeah, and um, like Sammy said, the re- realization finally came when it was going to impact on her children mm-hmm. and lead to potential removal, and that is something that we see for perpetrators right. um, as well. Perpetrators, just in the same way as victims, don't understand the impact that it can have on their children. Um, they'll say, "Well, they were in the next room; they didn't see anything," you know. But actually, evidence shows that the, um, the brain of a child that is in a domestically abusive household is similar to the brain of a child that's in a war zone. Right. The patterns in the brain show the same. You, the neuro pathways don't link the same. And in fact, 62% of children are directly physically harmed. Um when they're living in an abusive household now that can be intentional harm getting caught in the crossfire you know trying to stand in the way of 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 parents trying to protect mom um so the impact on children is huge and i think once people realize that 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 can be a real catalyst for change yeah one of the actual the, the flip side of that that phrase hurt people hurt people you know one of the things i've been thinking a lot about recently is i've met a ton of people within the mental health industry who come from abusive backgrounds and actually i've found that actually one thing that we don't talk about a lot of times is that hurt people often help people as well do you see a lot of that within the kind of with, within the organization that there's actually people that want to work in that type of position are people who've been abused themselves I would say that every staff member and every volunteer at the Wish has got their own reason for being there without a shadow of a doubt. Um, My first marriage was abusive um, and I think that that's part of the reason that I found myself where where I am. Um, Sammy obviously is one of our most amazing volunteers um, and she brings so much to the table because of her experience and yeah, I think if you speak to any staff member at the Wish uh, or volunteer, we've all got our reasons for being there. Definitely, yeah, I think it's it's, it's something really that doesn't. Oh, sorry, go on, Sam. I was just going to say that really drives me forward, doesn't it? It's like myself and Ma- Dave. You know, we've experienced mental health difficulties in the past, and that's the reason why we do this work. It just keeps you driving and driving and driving forward. But being yeah. around people as well, they've also got that shared experience. It's, you just bounce off each other, and you feel yeah. like you can take on the world. That's what I feel like when I work with Dave anyway. So it's, uh, I, yeah. feel I, I do, I do feel the same. You know, you, you know, I love working with you. You, um, it's, it's good you to actually have someone who can talk as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask the um, I was, no, I was just, I just wanted to bring up, bring a bit of attention to that really. And I think, I think there's an, you know, the, the, we hear the expression that hurt people hurt people a lot of times. And the, I've been trying to figure out a way to put this succinctly recently, but I think the best way I can say it is that, Often people's behavior can be explainable, but that doesn't make it excusable because I think often, oftentimes now within the mental health industry, people might say, oh, well, this person suffered this, therefore their behavior is, you know, is, it, that explains the behavior and it may explain the behavior, but I think there's no, that doesn't make it excusable. And, and it's like to, to say, okay, the past abuse caused this to happen doesn't mean that we say, we accept that and we move forward, you know, and I think, I think that's kind of, worth highlighting but it's also worth highlighting that there are many people out there that were abused that didn't become abusers themselves that actually went the opposite direction you know i often say i learned how to be a dad from my dad by learning how not to be a dad you know my dad had absolutely zero closeness to me whatsoever and and then i'm the exact opposite with my kids you know like i kind of learned from that and the same as kind of being a victim of bullying in school didn't it made me want to go on and help other people rather than wanting to hurt other people. Now, that's not me trying to put myself out here as a martyr or anything like that. But it's I'm just trying to say that, OK, if that is the case, that's why I was so interested in asking the questions about the perpetrators, because it's not something you ever really hear of. You never really hear like. And again, I think I think people 
if someone actually was a perpetrator of domestic abuse and then turn their life around, that person's probably not going to get up on stage because it's one of those things that I would say um, uh, domestic abuse is one of those things that a person almost from a society expectation is never forgiven for. Um, it's like, which is, you know, it's like, okay, well, where's the encouragement for this person to actually move forward and be something different and be something better with their life? Um, and yeah, I don't, I can't imagine anyone would ever, would want to come on a, a podcast or anything like that and say, yes, I used to, I used to beat people. Um, you know, it's like, it's, it's it's messy but i think it's worth saying to people that regardless of where you are in that if you've had if you've had a past where where you've been a victim of abuse yourself and you find yourself using that as a reason to explain the reason that you're abusive now that doesn't mean that that's a reason to continue to be abusive through the rest of your life identify that seek help um i didn't even realize that like the perpetrators team or anything like that existed so i'm actually quite fascinated to discover about that today and um you know it's it, yeah, I, I thought I actually honestly thought today we'd be talking entirely from the other the other point of view. So, it's it's important I think to highlight the fact that those people need need to get help. You know, we talk about it when we talk about bullying in school. Right? We're talking about change. You know, why a bully might be out of control in areas of their life, so they want to control someone that's weaker than them, um, or perceived to be weaker than them. Whereas, um, and we kind of try and look at it from that point, from the two sides when we actually, when Sam and I talk about it in schools, because obviously there's, there's two ways to, there's two ways to start to end these things, isn't there? There's you, you strengthen the victim, you give the victim options and a way out of all of this, but by disabling the perpetrator, and I don't mean like, you know, hitting them with a taser gun or anything, I mean, disabling them through understanding communication re-education rehabilitation um it's not even an option i even thought was on the table until this call so you know thanks for kind of highlighting that for us hey um a, another recent uh, i'm a bit of a stato i'm afraid another recent another recent study actually showed that incidents of physical abuse um dropped by 92 percent when a perpetrator did a dvpp um, so it, they can be really impactful. You know, if that person is ready, if that person is willing to make the changes that are necessary, yeah. they really are. They are really are worth the uh, worth the money. Do you ever find that the the people that have been violent they actually get back with the the same partner that they put all that that they've given the abuse to for I don't know how long. Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, and and you still do find that we work with um, couples who who want to try and remain together, who want to be able to kind of work through it. So um, the the lady will do the AIM program uh, with Julie, and um, the perpetrator will do make the change with Barbara and her team, um, and. Obviously, we make it very clear that the staff are going to communicate. Um, and if there's any incidents or anything like that, you know, then then he will have to leave the perpetrator programme. Um, but, yeah, we do get couples who want to remain together um, and both want to do the work. And, you know, we support them to do that if it's safe to do that obviously our paramount priority is the safety of, of the victim and any children but if we can make it safe then that's what we support them to do that must be really hard for it's for you to watch as well is it difficult for staff to, to see that that the the sort of the, the victim wants to stay with the abuser even though sometimes you feel that it's not the best thing for them, but they're so adamant that they want to stay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it can be difficult. It can be difficult. And and in some situations, it simply isn't safe, you know, and then you've got children's services stepping in and potential, you know, for removal of children, you know, as Sammy explained. Um, so sometimes it really isn't safe. Um, but, you know, sometimes with, with a, a real deep, need want for change and um two people who are prepared to work you know it can happen and you know it's not it's not for us to judge that it's it's for us to let them know that they have options um and and let them choose themselves yeah and, and sammy now now that you're sort of eight years on 
how how do you look back on your ex partner? Do you still carry a lot of anger around? Are you at a point no. where you I've I have dropped all anger and everything for me. I don't carry that anymore. I don't want to carry that around. I've let go of all that. So yeah, no, I don't keep hatred or anger in me anymore. But I did that for me, not for him. Yeah. And can, yeah. can I ask as well, just to go back to that time, just that I was going to ask earlier, when when you was in sort of the, the heart of all the abuse, how much did it change you as a person? Did it make you act out in ways that you didn't think was yourself? Yeah, I was. To be honest, I don't think I was a nice person myself. I was angry. I was, like, hitting out at the world. I didn't talk to anybody. I turned against my family, my friends. Yeah, I wasn't very nice. In the end of it, I wasn't myself. And it was, was it a really long recovery as well? You know, didn't Yeah, that? I mean, I left with PTSD and OCD. That's what I now deal with now as um, a consequence of that relationship, really. But, yeah. 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 You've done amazing. You, you Thank really you. I think it's absolutely unbelievable. And thank thank you for sharing. Thank you for being so open as well. You know, we really appreciate it. It's I want to keep asking questions and questions, but I, 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 I don't want to sort of take control of all the conversation. Dave, do you have any I, questions? I, I do, I, I do. Um, so one of the things I've seen when working, because I've worked with people who they – Basically, they come to me for coaching, but it's quite obvious that they they've got they're in a, within a controlling relationship. And one of the um, things that is being controlled is is finances. You know, it's, it starts off with oh, you know, it's our, our, my job's okay to look after both of us. You don't need to work and all the rest of it. I'll keep you and all the rest of it. And then further into the relationship, it's then well, this person's got absolutely the money's being controlled. They're getting given and you know an allowance. They've got a certain amount they're allowed to spend. And it's like if they spend any more over that, you know, it's 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 an issue. And one of the things that obviously the the perpetrator in this instance has led that person to believe is that, well, you're not going to survive out there in the world without me and without my financial support. What sort of thing is available to a person in that situation? Like if someone is like being fully financially controlled, they don't have any way of supporting themselves directly. What sort of, you know, what sort of thing is available for a person in that situation? They were sent uh, definitely, you know, um, what they need with him telling them that that they have nothing they need to depend on them that's what he wants her to yeah. think so she can't go anywhere can't get any help doesn't have any money but in fact if she actually left that person everything would come together and she would have her own money mm. you know they want them to think that and they want them to believe that so they don't go and access that help and so they don't have funds to actually leave that person yeah yeah I mean, some of the banks now, uh, Lloyd's, I know, and HSBC, um, actually have specific advisors that are trained around uh, financial abuse um, that you can request a private appointment with um, to discuss um, your finances, if your finances are being controlled by by just one party. Um if you are eligible for benefits, that's something that we at the Wish Centre can support you to um, apply for. Um, refuge, if, if you were to leave and, and go into a refuge property, refuges are paid by housing benefit. So uh, if you qualify for housing benefit, you would. And we do uh, we do ask that you don't work while you're in refuge, purely for a safety uh, from a safety perspective, um, because it, it it would be easy for you to be followed from your place of work back to refuge, and then of course, you know everyone who's in refuge is at risk. Then, um, so housing benefit pays for refuge accommodation. There are you know benefits available, um, but but we can also support around things like signposting for training, um, job opportunities. Um, you know, we really, you know, we're quite a holistic service. And where the refuges are concerned, particularly when you've got families that, are, you know, where there are children involved, are those refuges, would they be able to rehouse the, the victim plus the children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so our, our refuges um, can take anything from a single woman to a woman and up to six children. So we've got different sort of sizes of, of properties. 
Um, and then we do support when their time in refuge is coming to an end and they feel that that they're ready to go back to independent living. We do support them with the housing process then. Yeah. What are some of the early warning signs that you can see if a relationship is kind of about you know is is becoming is heading towards abusive because a lot of these things like for example the love bombs you could just be in a situation with someone who's just genuinely like you know loves to express love over the top and and so on and so forth are there any kind of things that are genuine red flags that you would suggest people look out for I think it's about the control. So it's all well and good someone, you know, wanting to to really coddle you and 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 love you, but are they actually controlling where you're going, who you're seeing, what you're wearing? Are they, you know, um are they taking up all of your time? Are they trying to prevent you seeing other people? Um you know, so ultimately it's a, it's about um, are they, we all know that a healthy relationship is about give and take, but are they removing your options? Are they um, manipulating you into removing your own options? Mm. It's like guilt tripping, in, guilt, guilt tripping you to, for example, uh, I, I had a, one, one of my one of my colleagues who was a nurse that her partner she started seeing this this gentleman and he started to sort of guilt trip her into staying in with her rather than going out with going out with her friends at the weekend some cocktails he used to say to her like oh why are you doing that I thought you'd stay with me I thought you loved me and he just start making a doubt of herself and you could see it slowly happening thankfully yeah. she did leave the relationship but it's yeah. would you say that's that they are the, the type of early signs that people need to look yeah out? absolutely you know. It's it's very easy to say, no, oh, I'm going to miss you when you go out. But you don't try and stop them going out. No. You just say, I'm going to miss you when, you know, when you go away for the weekend with the boys or the girls or whatever. But you wouldn't try and prevent that happening. Because, you know, ultimately a relationship is about respect, isn't it? And, you know, um, I sure we all respect our partner's need for time on their own and so it's when the things that starts to disappear and that isn't there you know that monopoly of your time and attention um for me that would be that would be quite an early warning sign do you think for for the the abuser do you think it's fear of uh for example the the, the, the woman talking to other other men when she's out is is that something that's causing that the need for control or yeah I mean that's something that we see an awful lot of um you know if you're if you want to go out with the girls it's because you want to chat to other blokes um you know that's something and then almost she'll say well I won't go out then to try and disprove his point you know and then that that's the way it it starts really um but but that I mean that is something that those accusations of cheating and whatnot that is something that we see in a huge huge majority of um but whether they truly believe that that's the case or it's just a way to get you to stay in or where they want you can I ask a question now? So this is some advice, really. So in some of the schools that I've been to, I talk about fear sometimes, and there's been a handful of pupils in different schools that have said that their fear is the father in terms of how they are, what they're seeing at home, basically. Now, I when, when, anything, when anything like that happens, I then hand that over to the school and talk it through with the safeguarding team within the school. Sometimes, though, I don't feel like there's action being taken. Occasionally, when I talk to individual staff members, it feels like they don't want to take action. They don't want to open up Pandora's box. What do you advise me to do there? Um, I mean, you know, the CADS team at at Children's Social Care, they're they're good at sort of offering advice. Um, It's a difficult one, really. I suppose, you know, talking to someone I know you say you talk to the teachers I mean you know it's the teachers probably know the children better um 
so you know asking asking the teachers for their advice would always be would always be a good first step um school nurses again you know they may know although there aren't they're few and far between at the moment they're not really what they used to be are they um but I think sort of a search for some more information around that that child um you know it, it's very difficult when you come to to questioning a child really I think that takes sort of special skills um to to speak to a child and get them to speak openly um but yeah I would start by by sort of questioning the teachers for some more information and if need be you know take it to CADS if you really are concerned I think as well Sam it's it's exactly what Rebecca said getting that information and it might be you know it's not it's not your role to be questioning them children absolutely what they tell you you pass on but it might be that the school actually know that this has been dealt with that this is an ongoing thing that the other services are involved so it might be that having that conversation they put your mind at ease um and if they don't um it is like like Rebecca said perhaps having a conversation with social care whether that's CADS at Blackburn or Lancashire Social Care um but yeah having those conversations but it might be that the school know well they will know a lot more about that child and family than than perhaps we do yeah perfect Dave any questions um well we've got a few questions in the chat that we could get to in a bit but um my I suppose my main question is obviously we're all kind of talking from round lanks here um and the podcast and these episodes go out, well, this is actually going out. I know for a fact I've got at least one person in Belgium in the chat right now. So, um, but um, this goes, yeah, this goes, this goes nationwide, but also, you know, goes, goes worldwide once it's on, once it's on YouTube and on Twitch. Um, I'm not expecting you to have worldwide contacts, but do you have contacts for like resources that people could access from across the UK, right? Regardless of where they're located. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we we have the resources that I was talking about. I mean, it was specifically the resources on our website were developed for uh, COVID, um, but but they're relevant all year round. So safety advice um, for for victims and certain resources are on there. So there's a safety plan for children as well. Because if a child uh, is living in a household where there's domestic abuse, it's important for them to know what to do when they're frightened. Okay. Um, so so those resources are on our, our and website. And what's the website address? Uh, it is www.thewishcentre.org. Right. What else is centre spelled? C-E-N-T-R-E or T-E-R? T-R-E. So... W- w- I know. W- I'm putting it in the chat for people who are live now. So www.thewishcenter.org. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's so that's in the ch- and perfect. And also, um, if so, there's a, a website. The government's campaign during COVID was called a No Excuse for Abuse, and their website. You can put your postcode in and it will find your local domestic abuse service. So obviously we're local to Blackburn with Darwin. Lancashire Victim Services support victims uh, around the rest of Lancashire. Um, But there are also sort of smaller independent services as well that can be equally as helpful, like this Harve at the Emily David Centre uh, Emily Davidson Centre in Accrington, um, you know. So there are there are smaller services as well as as Lancashire victims uh, services. Yeah. Um, so the No Excuse for Abuse website will be able to link you to to services throughout the country. Okay. okay. I did. Sorry, I got kicked out and missed all of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we did discuss putting links on. Um, Sam said you'd be able to put links on. Yeah, afterwards. we can put as ma- we can put as many links as you want on the YouTube yeah. video. Just send me a, send me a bucket load. <laughs> like... We can. There's a, there's an app as well called um, Hub of yeah, Hope. Yeah, we use. Yeah, and I think we use that. So again, you know, somebody could put in the postcode and find out their local. Um, domestic violence services using that. Yeah. yeah, there's also a really good app, um, but I, I, I will I will send you the details. So it, it's hidden on the um, on your phone. It doesn't. It looks like a weather app, um, but it's got some really good information around what is domestic abuse, um, what are the warning signs, and also that is it will link you to your local service. Yeah. 
So, um, have you had any experience with like these the sort of the social media independent campaigns? Like, for example, the one where someone puts up a post saying, um, "If you're getting in an abusive relationship, message me saying, ask me if I'm still selling makeup." I think is the one I've seen, and it's like, and I'll if I'm wearing eyeliner. Yeah, and if you are, um, ask about you know, you ask about eyeliner or you ask about lipstick or whatever it might be for to kind of, and you get a friend to report a. Um, or like report a domestic um, abuse incident on your behalf. Have you have you come across anything like that? Yeah, I mean, and there was quite a few, wasn't there, during uh, during lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think <laughs> I think the one thing that the very first thing that I thought is if I've seen then this, so is the abuser. There are there are perpetrators that have seen this. Um, so you are if if he has seen it or she has seen it and you ask that question and he, he or she knows what it's about you potentially add into your risk there yeah. yeah i suppose that is a bit of a double edged sword with these things isn't it because anything that you try and make public knowledge um like is public knowledge not just yeah. for the um the victim but also the perpetrator mm. yeah Exactly. In and in chat, and I'm actually very interested to know the answer to this question as well. I'll I'll elaborate on the the question from the chat a little bit because it just says what's the situation regards to um regards to male victims. It's like there's two parts I want to ask to that question. One is it common um for there to be male victims as well, and the second part of it is you know you talked earlier about the stigma and 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 the shame around it. Is that something that you see even more of in in male victims than than in female victims? What would you know the whole man up kind of thing yeah yeah absolutely i think i think that there is more uh stigma attached to male victims and i think it's exactly the same with uh mental health issues um men feel that they have to be manly they can't talk about that kind of thing um you know so yes i do i do think that there is more stigma and and shame attached to male victims sadly we do see many more female victims and again i think that's possibly because women are we're quite good at reaching out once we make our minds up we're going to do it um we're quite good at, at we're quite resourceful aren't we we chat to the girls we chat to our mums we chat to you know we we're we're better at chatting in some ways than than men um and um we do see i i think it is still quite a gender based situation i do believe that there are more female victims mm-hmm. i do believe that we don't see the amount of male victims that there are because of that shame and that stigma um there are i mean respect is the national helpline to support men uh we support men um but that that is the national sort of service that will support male victims of domestic abuse they also support um they do the work with perpetrators as well so that's a male very male-based charity um refuge uh women's aid can all point men in the in the direction of someone that will help like I say, we support men, Lancashire Victim Services, I know they support men. Um, so there is there really is help out there mm-hmm. um for men if if they wanted to reach out to us. And definitely. how about within same sex relationships? Yes, yeah. A, a lot of the men that we see coming forward are are in same sex relationships. Um definitely um but there you know there are female perpetrators out there there's there's we're not denying that there absolutely are female perpetrators out there is that something you'd um, see within female female same-sex relationships as, as well yeah, yes so. yeah absolutely yeah we do see we do see it in female same-sex relationships yeah okay. um so what was the question number there's a, there's a reasonably long question i think <laughs> um actually i'll go back to this one well, earlier you said obviously and if if within the when you're working with both with both partners um there can be with if there is another incident that you know that basically the the man would be then excluded from the program the question is so well is it kind of counterproductive to cancel help for perpetrators where there is another incident isn't them having incidents the exact proof that they need more and quicker help 
I do understand the point, and they're not excluded for from the program indefinitely. They can apply to cut, you know, they can be reassessed to come back on the next course. But because we are, you know, we are potentially talking about very high risk situations, yeah. we have to make our priority the safety of the victim and the children. Yeah. Makes sense. The the whole perpetrator, you know, the whole perpetrator team is geared to safety. Yeah. Um. So that has to be our top priority. Okay. Um. We've also got so we've got a question from someone who's in a polyamorous relationship, and um, well, I'm trying to see what the, where the question is in that some. Uh, where's it gone actually I'll just read out the Hulk statement actually he says I'm open minded about all kinds of relationship dynamics sometimes partners can help one another by exercising control or guidance there's a difference between control and controlling for me the red flag is consent if they are being controlling over aspects of your life where they keep doing it even though you have told them you don't want that so in conclusion would you say there is less domestic abuse happening in polyamorous people might not be something you've had much um experience with really because we don't I, I mean i've not worked with a single polyamorous person yet in anything that i've done so yeah i'm to be i haven't in all honesty um and i do understand the point about consent um but sometimes can consent can be coerced from people um so you know, it, it would be a case of, of carefully assessing the dynamics there, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the probably the underpinning thing in, within a polyamorous relationship is that not is that no one is anyone else's direct, you know, one to one partner, and therefore, yeah. therefore, the same dynamics about expressing kind of expectations around a person. You know, if they're going out to see somebody else, but the underlying basis of the relationship is polyamory, and um, then. I suppose that's going to be quite an obvious thing straight away you know it's like we yeah because the boundaries are completely different in that situation than um than any other relationship um i don't think there is any more questions in there for that no more questions no i think that's i think that's the lot i think the rest of it's by the looks of it weren't there is a couple of people in chat having a conversation with each other so <laughs> just that's the um, the thing is trying to highlight which ones are the questions and which ones are uh, uh just yeah just conversation but i think that's it with the questions from the chat have you got any other questions dave or because i know we've, we've already gone over already we, I could, there's loads of more questions we could we could ask but I, I think i think i've asked everything i want to ask to be perfectly honest um and I think obviously if we can get those links and everything that we can put in the description um, when this goes up on YouTube, I think it's just, I think the important thing, one, one of the things I like to do with these episodes is make sure that there's something actionable people, you know, people can take action on kind of if they hear this and they need to, they want to take the next step rather than it just being information. We want to, we want to be able to signpost people. So I think it's great the places that we've actually mentioned so far. Um, it, do you, I mean, any of the guests, do you think there's any important part of this that we've overlooked? No? We've covered it. I will sort out a list of contacts, et cetera, for afterwards. But I think you're right. The, the aim is people ask for help, exactly what Sammy said. Ask for help. Um, yeah. Where, wherever you ask, just ask. Yeah. Sam, have you got anything yeah. else? No. No. Rebecca, anything? No. No, I think we've covered everything there. It's been great. I'd, I'd just like to end then just by saying a huge thank you to you all for, for coming on. Uh, Sammy, thank you for being so open about your story and stuff. I think you're a very, very inspired individual. So thank you very much. And I apologise if I asked some very personal questions. I felt very bad last time. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much. That is a, another episode of the Mental Health Family Hour done. If anyone wants to ask me further questions, uh, feel free to email me again on sam.tyra at lscft. I'm trying to get used to that, Rebecca. You know, the new not nhs.uk. Um, so repeat so that. In. Repeat that in its entirety, just in isolation now, Sam, because that's going to get lost in the... Yeah, start... What is the email address, <laughs> Sam? Sam dot Tyra T Y R E R at L S C F T dot N H S dot UK. So if anyone has any questions or you just want to get in contact with the show, then uh, please do feel free to email me. 
please do share this uh, with your networks. You know, the more people that listen to this, the better. So thank you very much for tuning in and we will see you again soon. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. And I'm going to stick around for a few minutes just to kind of say goodbye to the uh, to the Twitch chat. And um, But yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for your time today.